Now that we've looked at metabolism in cells, we can use that knowledge to discuss what microbes need to be happy and to reproduce quickly. What do they need in the way of resources? With that knowledge, we'll then look at how we can limit their growth. Now, some microbes can grow very quickly, especially bacteria. E. coli, if it's in perfect conditions in a laboratory setting, can divide every 20 minutes. That means if you put one bacterium on a Petri dish, you can end up with a million bacteria in just seven hours. Now, I should point out that that's not the case in the wild, so to speak. Bacteria that are out there in the real world do grow much more slowly because there are limiting factors. Requirements for microbial growth can be broken down into two broad categories. First of all, we have physical requirements. What I'm talking about here are the physical characteristics of the environment in which we find the microbe. Probably the most important characteristics would be temperature, pH, and osmotic pressure. Many microbes have very specific needs when it comes to these three characteristics. They need a certain range of temperature, a certain range of pH, and a certain range of solute concentration. Then we have chemical requirements, and there are quite a few. Of course, any living thing is going to require a source of carbon to build its own macromolecules. We need nitrogen and sulfur and phosphorus. Nitrogen is found in nucleic acids and it's found in amino acids. Sulfur likewise is found in many amino acids. And phosphate, of course, is needed to make ATP and it's also needed to make nucleotides. There's going to be other organic growth factors that might increase the rate at which the bacterium can grow. We have trace elements, things like iron, for instance, magnesium, that are needed by cells in small quantities, and oxygen, which may be something the cell requires if it's an aerobic cell, or it may be something that will damage the cell. So there are, of course, some cells that are anaerobic and they want to be in an environment where there is no oxygen. Let's start by looking at temperature. Temperature is one of the easiest things to manipulate if you want to control the rate of bacteria growth. It's the reason that you have a refrigerator and a freezer in your house. So remember that at higher temperatures, chemical reactions can occur more quickly because molecules are moving around more rapidly, they have more kinetic energy, they bump into each other more rapidly. But also remember that for the most part, every reaction in a cell is catalyzed by an enzyme. And enzymes are proteins and they denature at high heat. So we have this range where chemical reactions, the reactions of life can occur quickly. If we have temperatures below that, then the molecules involved are moving too slowly. If we have temperatures above that range, then what's gonna happen is enzymes are gonna denature and they're going to stop working. So this zone that's labeled the danger zone here is the region in which most bacteria do quite well. It's called the danger zone because if you leave food out in this temperature range, it will be colonized by bacteria quite quickly. They will grow quickly. They will cause spoilage quite quickly. Food spoilage is caused by bacteria and also fungi breaking down food and releasing waste products into that food. For most bacteria, they can survive and reproduce up to a maximum temperature of about 50 degrees Celsius. If you increase the temperature beyond that, they will stop reproducing and they may also die. If we increase it further, of course, if we get up to boiling, then that will kill just about any bacterium. Now remember there are archaea, which are prokaryotes that are not bacteria, but they're similar in many ways, that can survive very high temperatures. Now fortunately, they are not problematic. We have an optimum growth temperature of about 37 degrees, which coincidentally is the temperature of our bodies. That is the normal temperature for a mammal. And then for minimum growth, typically bacteria do not grow below four degrees Celsius. 
Now lowering the temperature below that won't necessarily kill them. They may go into a dormant state, but it will prevent them from dividing and it will basically shut down their metabolism. This is why your refrigerator has a temperature of approximately four degrees Celsius. If we freeze the environment, then no growth is going to occur. Metabolism is going to shut right down, chemical reactions are going to slow down, but also water will not be available to those cells because the water is now frozen. Evolution often favors specialization. Organisms that become highly adapted to a narrow range of conditions find that they have fewer competitors to worry about. On this chart, you're seeing the preferences of five groups of prokaryotes. We have temperature along the bottom on the x-axis and growth rate along the y-axis. We have mesophiles. Meso means middle, phile means to love. These are prokaryotes that love those middle of the road temperatures between 20 degrees Celsius and 40 degrees Celsius. These are the bacteria that you're most likely to encounter in your environment. They're the bacteria that live on surfaces in your house. They're the bacteria that are likely to cause your food to go bad if you leave it out on the kitchen counter. They're also bacteria that live in our bodies, things like E. coli. We have prokaryotes that prefer things a bit warmer. Those are the thermophiles. And we have the hyperthermophiles, which prefer things really hot, sometimes hotter than boiling. Hyperthermophiles consist of members of the domain archaea, almost exclusively. We have some prokaryotes that like things cooler. So we have the psychrotrophs that prefer things a little bit cooler than the mesophiles would. And then we have psychrophiles that like things quite cold. And these are prokaryotes and also fungi that might do well in your refrigerator, for instance. So just as examples here, we have E. coli that is normally found in the colon. And when we're growing it in the lab, we usually grow it at about 37 degrees Celsius. That's convenient for most of the bacteria we're working with, but they can actually uh, survive at higher temperatures and actually their preference, the temperature at which they have the highest growth rate is a little bit higher at 40 degrees Celsius. Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes tuberculosis of course, prefers body temperature, that's not a surprise. The mycobacterium that causes leprosy prefers things a bit cooler and it tends to be found in the extremities of our bodies, which are a bit cooler. The other one I'll point out here is Listeria, which is a bacterium that can cause food poisoning. Um, it's something that's found on food that's not properly refrigerated. It's something that you may have heard of before because outbreaks of Listeria cause problems with grocery store food. Listeria can be found within the soil, and for that reason, it can occasionally contaminate fruits and vegetables. If those fruits and vegetables are transported and stored at low temperature, generally this isn't an issue, and that's because Listeria does not grow very effectively at lower temperatures. But imagine a situation where a supermarket has a problem with their refrigerator. It breaks down and fruits and vegetables are left at room temperature for several hours. Well, just to be safe, that food should probably be thrown away because if Listeria is present on the surface of those fruits and vegetables, it will have an opportunity to grow and maybe reach concentrations where it can cause harm to people that ingest it. If you eat contaminated fruit or vegetables, then these cells can become intracellular parasites. They can burrow into the cells of your body reproduce within those cells and cause damage to tissues throughout the body. One thing they can do is cause a form of meningitis, which is an infection of the membrane that surrounds and protects the central nervous system. Unfortunately, Listeria can also cross the placenta and cause problems for unborn babies. Now, this is fairly rare. You do hear about cases isolated cases 
nearly every year, but it generally doesn't affect a large population of people. However, if you are concerned about this, one piece of advice I might offer is to buy intact fruit instead of fruit that's cut up. So fruit that's cut up like this melon here provides more surface area that's moist and damp and inviting for bacteria. There's more opportunity for them to grow. Also in the case of something like a cantaloupe here, bacteria that's on the outside rind, well, you're not going to consume that. You're consuming the flesh of the fruit. Microbes can be especially picky when it comes to pH. We have neutrophiles that love near neutral conditions. And note that the majority, but definitely not all, bacteria fit into this category. We have acidophiles that like things more acidic. They like a lower pH. And we have alkalophiles that like things more basic. They prefer a higher pH. Note that fungi, for the most part, tend to like their environment to be a bit more acidic than do bacteria. Fungi also tend to outcompete bacteria at lower temperatures. So when we're growing fungi in the lab, we incubate them at near room temperature, and we also provide them with media that's a bit more acidic than we would give to bacteria. Now, one of the bacteria that definitely is not a neutrophile is the one you see running across the bottom of the screen here. This is Helicobacter pylori. This is an acidophile and it actually lives and reproduces and causes issues within your stomach. Your stomach has an extremely low pH. The pH of your stomach acid is pretty close to battery acid, yet this bacteria can live in those environments and it causes ulcerations or sores on the stomach lining. Here you're seeing Helicobacter bacteria, again, a very unusual organism in that it can survive these really harsh conditions in the stomach. The stomach is a barrier to most microbes. So endospores and cysts might be able to pass through, but for the most part, vegetative cells, active cells are killed very quickly by the stomach acid. Osmotic pressure refers to the amount of internal pressure that we would need to apply to prevent the motion of a solvent into a cell. So imagine that we have a cell that's in pure water. It's in an environment of pure H2O. Well, inside the cell, of course, we don't have pure water. We have a lot of dissolved salts and other solutes. So water is going to enter the cell in that hypotonic condition. Water would enter the cell. The amount of pressure we would have to apply to stop that from happening would be referred to as the osmotic pressure. If we have a cell in an isotonic solution, that means we have the same amount of solute inside the cell and outside the cell. We don't have a net movement of water. Water is moving in and moving back out, but it's doing so at the same rate. Now imagine that we take a cell and we put it into a hypertonic solution. What that means is we have a lot more solute outside of the cell. The other way to think about that is we have less water outside of the cell. Water will be pulled out. We have a negative osmotic pressure. Water is being removed from the cell. We create hypertonic solutions when we cure meat using salt or when we pickle stuff. And what this does is it removes water from any bacteria that might be present, and that's gonna cause problems for the cell. It's gonna cause problems with its metabolic rate. Just like any other cell, microorganisms are going to require a source of food. They're going to require a source of carbon to build macromolecules. They need a source of energy. Some microbes might use sunlight, for instance, to manufacture their own food, but heterotrophic organisms, which are the ones we're gonna focus on, are ones that need to take in food molecules. We need a source of nitrogen, we need a source of sulfur, and we need a source of phosphorus, as we've talked about. Most organisms require specific compounds that they cannot manufacture themselves. So for instance, 
we require essential amino acids, amino acids that we cannot manufacture within our body. The same is the case for microbes, although it differs from microbe to microbe. So they may require specific amino acids and they have to get them from their environment. They may require certain nucleotides, vitamins, etc. And then also, of course, there will be trace elements, iron, copper, zinc, magnesium, calcium, etc., that are needed in very small amounts, but they are essential to the functioning of the cell. Oxygen is a building block of many macromolecules. So all living things will contain a little bit of oxygen, but free diatomic gaseous oxygen is poisonous to many microbes. These microbes are anaerobic. What you're seeing in this example here is microbes growing within a broth that contains thioglycolate. Thioglycolate will absorb oxygen. It grabs onto it and makes it unavailable. So this is a good media to use if you want to grow up anaerobic bacteria. There won't be any um, oxygen freely available within the broth. In the first example here, we're seeing a culture where we have lots of cells that have migrated to the top of the media, and that's because they're obligate aerobes. Obligate means that you have to do something, so they require oxygen. They cannot live without it. They will migrate towards the surface in this media where there is exposure to air and exposure to free oxygen. Then we have facultative anaerobes. So in the second tube there, these are bacteria that can live without oxygen, but if oxygen is present, they would prefer to have access to it because of course they get more energy out of their food. So we can see that they cluster towards the top, but we do have some that are avoiding the competition and they're migrating deeper into the media and they're surviving without oxygen. In the third tube, we have obligate anaerobes. These are microbes that will be poisoned by oxygen. So they stay away from the surface where there's exposure to the free oxygen that's found within the air. Then we have aerotolerant anaerobes. So here we have bacteria or other microbes that are generally anaerobic. And we can see that most of them are at the bottom of the tube, but if there is oxygen present, they can survive that and they will spread themselves out to avoid competition. There are a few that are living further up in the tube. Finally, we have micro aerophiles. So they appreciate an environment that has some oxygen, but not too much. And again, the reason for that is that oxygen can be a destructive molecule. It will oxidize things. It will rip electrons off of molecules. They want a bit of oxygen, but not a lot. Clostridium is a genus of bacteria that includes some obligate anaerobic members that can cause a lot of destruction to tissue. They're associated with gangrene. This is a condition where we have reduced blood flow to an area, and as you might expect, that's going to result in decreased levels of oxygen arriving at those tissues. This particular bacterium generates a lot of hydrogen and other gases as a byproduct of its metabolism. What you're seeing here, and I apologize that it's a rather gory image, used to be a foot. As you might imagine, working with anaerobic microbes in a laboratory setting is rather tricky. And that's because the people working in the lab are not anaerobic. So we have to isolate the bacteria. What you can do is you can use glass containers and then throw in uh, a compound that will release carbon dioxide or other gases. Something as simple as baking powder even. That gas will fill up the canister and then at the top of the canister there might be a one-way valve that will allow any oxygen to exit being forced out by that carbon dioxide or at the top of the container, there may be a pellet of palladium that will soak up any free oxygen. If you wanna do this kind of work on a larger scale, you'll need an anaerobic glove box. And you're seeing that in the photo on the right. In this particular lab, one full wall 
of the lab is dedicated to working with anaerobic bacteria. They have shelves with their equipment and their supplies and their cultures and so on that are all maintained within an oxygen free cabinet. And the only way they can access any of that is to use these sealed gloves. Recall that in the real world, microbes tend to grow as biofilms. We have these complex mixtures of microbes that are found living together and interacting with each other on the surface of an object. In the lab, we almost always grow microbes as pure cultures. They're easier to study that way. They tend to grow faster and grow better if they're not competing with other microbes. However, there may be some cases where we will grow them as mixed cultures if we're interested in examining the relationships between microbes or if it's a microbe that needs to have living cells to parasitize. The majority of microbes live within an aqueous environment, a water-based environment. If we want to grow up large quantities of bacteria, for instance, we'll generally use liquid media, also known as broth. A very common liquid media that's used in labs to grow a variety of different species of bacteria is terrific broth, or TB. As we'll see, this is a complex media. It allows for the growth of many different microbes. We have a similar general purpose broth that we use in the lab. We use triptych soy broth. For reasons we'll talk about in a moment, it quite often makes sense to grow bacteria on a solid medium instead of a liquid medium. You can take your favorite recipe for liquid media or broth and add something called agar to it and it will solidify. It's kind of like making jello. Agar is an extract from seaweed and it's sold as a white powder. Now you can buy it in grocery stores as well. It's usually referred to as agar agar and you can use it to solidify food. Now what you do is you take your favorite liquid medium and you add some of this and then you put that in the autoclave. The autoclave, of course, will sterilize your media and at the same time melt the agar. While it's still hot and liquid, you can pour it into the base of a Petri plate. And that's how Petri plates are made. That's how we make Petri plates in our own lab. Now you can also pour that liquid medium with the agar added into a tube that forms something known as an agar deep. Or you can do the same thing, but then put the tube on a slant so that the surface of the agar will be slanted in the tube. And that's referred to as an agar slant. It provides you with more surface area over which aerobic bacteria can grow. If we sufficiently dilute a bacterial sample and spread it onto a petri plate on solid media, colonies will form. A colony is the result of one single cell that has divided over and over and over again. Quite often the shape of that colony and the texture of the colony can help you figure out what species you're dealing with. So certain species have distinct colors, distinct shapes, distinct textures, uh, distinct margins. So the margin can be lobate or irregular or smooth, etc. On this plate here, we can see that we have at least 12 different species of bacteria. And we're basing that solely on the characteristics of the colonies that they formed. The macroscopic characteristics of a colony can be diagnostic in some cases. So some species have very characteristic colonies, like for instance, members of the mycoplasma. They have this really interesting fried egg appearance. Imagine that you were presented with a mixed culture of bacteria. Maybe we've got several different genetic strains of one species all mixed together, or maybe we've got several different species mixed together. How would you go about 
isolating out those different bacteria and growing pure cultures? Well, you could use a technique known as streaking. This is the same technique that Robert Koch used in his experiments. If you remember back to Koch's postulates, one of the things you have to do if you want to link a microbe with a certain disease is test pure cultures. So what you would do is you would take your mixture and you would take an inoculating loop, sterilize that with the flame of a Bunsen burner, dip the loop into your culture, and then spread it across the surface of a Petri plate, like so. Now next, you would sterilize your inoculating loop again, but instead of placing it back into the liquid culture, you would instead drag that sterile loop across your first streak. What you're doing is you're picking up some of that bacteria, and as you go back and forth across the surface, you're diluting that bacteria more and more. We're going to do this again. We're going to take our inoculating loop and sterilize it to kill any remaining bacteria, and then we're going to drag that sterile loop across the second streak. And at this point, bacteria should be getting few and far between they should start to settle out on the surface as isolated single cells. We'll do it one more time for good luck. So sterilize the loop, drag it across one last time. Now what you would expect to see is something like this. So in our first and second streak, we have lots of bacteria. They're very close together. They spread very rapidly until they touch, and we get a continuous surface of bacteria that's referred to as a lawn of bacteria. But after our third and fourth streaks, we get isolated colonies. Within each of those colonies, we have genetically identical cells. They all came from a single cell that settled out at that spot. So now we can take a second inoculating loop and we can pick up that colony, dump it into some liquid media, and that will grow into a pure culture. Not only will all the bacteria be of the same species, but they will be genetically identical. Bacteria, especially if they're aerobic, are pretty easy to culture in the lab. But what about viruses? Well, it depends on the type of virus. In all cases though, viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. That means that we can't simply throw them on a Petri plate. They have to be grown inside cells. They can only reproduce inside cells. If we're studying bacteriophages, we can use bacteria as our host. And that's a relatively simple process. If we're studying animal viruses, like the kind of viruses that might infect us, we have to use living tissue culture. And why might we bother? Well, of course, we want to understand how viruses work. So we can use cultures to study the virus life cycle. We can do this to grow up large quantities of virus that we can then use to manufacture a vaccine, something we'll talk about later. And another interesting biotech application of bacteriophages is that we can put DNA of interest into them and actually use them to inject DNA into other cells for us. If we want to grow or culture bacteriophages, the first thing we need is a lawn of bacteria. A bacterial lawn is a continuous growth of bacteria. We have billions of bacteria cells. They're not forming isolated colonies. Instead, they're touching each other. In order to produce this lawn of bacteria, you use what's called a spreader. You can use a plastic sterile spreader, or you can use a glass spreader and sterilize it yourself using ethanol and a Bunsen burner. Here in Canada, the spreaders are usually referred to as hockey sticks. So after spreading the bacteria with your spreader or hockey stick, you allow the bacteria to soak into the agar, and then you spread a solution containing the bacteriophage on top of that. You let your bacteria grow and they will grow into a lawn, but shortly after you'll see holes developing within that lawn. You'll see circles where there is no bacteria. And the reason for that 
is that's where a bacteriophage settled out. It infected a bacterial cell, reproduced inside it, lysed that cell, so ruptured it, and then went on to infect the neighboring cells. And it spread out from there, forming this kind of crop circle within the lawn of bacteria. On these three plates here, the white spots that you see, those are referred to as plaques, and those are holes within the lawn of bacteria. There's no live bacteria there, but there are a lot of bacteriophages within those circles that can be collected. Note that in these three examples here, they've used a different titer or concentration of bacteriophage. To culture animal viruses, embryonated chicken eggs are quite often used. So depending on the virus, it might be injected into the amniotic fluid that surrounds the embryo. It might be injected into the yolk, or it might be injected into one of the extra embryonic tissues or membranes. We can also propagate viruses using tissue culture. And in fact, for many viruses, this is the only way we can study them in the lab. To start a tissue culture, what you do is you take some of the host tissue and you treat it with enzymes. The enzymes will break apart the proteins that act like a glue to hold the cells together. You then take your suspension of cells and pour it into a culture dish. The culture dish has been pre-treated with proteins that stick to the bottom of the dish and form kind of a false basement membrane that the cells can stick to. The cells will divide by mitosis and they'll spread out. And finally, we'll get to a point where all the cells are touching each other. Once that happens, cell division ceases. This is something known as density dependent growth. Once all the cells are touching, there's no more growth. Now, if you want to have multiple layers of cells and if you want the cells to divide a bit faster, it might be best to use tumor cells. You can take tumor cells and they will divide pretty much uncontrollably. You'll have a much thicker layer of tissue growing in your tissue dish. The other advantage to tumor cells is that they may, in some cases, be immortal. So your cells have an expiration date stamped on them. And the reason for that is that every time a cell divides, the chromosomes shorten a bit. A little bit of DNA is lost from the ends of your chromosomes during each cell division. And at max, you have typically 200 to 250 cell divisions that can occur before the chromosome erodes enough that important genes are impacted. Now, the reason it doesn't happen right away is because you have a lot of junk DNA, something known as telomeres at the ends of your chromosomes. The cells that give rise to gametes, sperm and egg, add this junk DNA. They contain enzymes that are known as telomerases that add these sequences that delay the effects of this erosion. Well, there are some cancer cells that also express telomerase and they keep lengthening their chromosomes. The chromosomes don't shorten during each division and that means that these cells don't have an expiration date. They just keep dividing. Tens of thousands of laboratories around the world maintain human cell cultures. And these human cell cultures are used to study the functioning of cells. They're used to study the life cycle of important viruses that infect us. And they're used to grow up viruses that can then be used to generate vaccines. Many of these cell cultures can be traced back to one particular person, a person by the name of Henrietta Lacks. In 1951, she had cervical cancer and she went into John Hopkins University Hospital. They took a sample of this cervical cancer and found that it grew really, really well and it was immortal. And we still have lines of these cells all around the world that are used in research. It's an interesting little bit of ethics that you might want to 
read up on if you have an interest in that. She didn't know at the time of her death that her cells had been collected and were still being perpetuated. And in fact, her family didn't find out until 20 years later. But we owe a lot of what we know about human biology and also about the functioning of viruses to this particular person. If we're working with viruses in a laboratory setting, or maybe we're working with microorganisms or other infectious agents, we always need to practice sterile or aseptic technique. This refers to techniques and protocols that reduce contamination. So what you're seeing here is an individual that's pouring plates in a biological safety cabinet. That biological safety cabinet or laminar flow hood is going to ensure that air from the lab can't contaminate the plates as they're being poured. He's also wearing gloves and a mask and a hairnet and so on, trying to limit the potential of bacteria landing on those plates and contaminating them. Let's talk about the media that's used to grow microbes in the lab, and we'll focus on media that's used to grow bacteria. Media that's referred to as chemically defined or synthetic is media where we know the exact composition. We know exactly how much glucose there is, exactly how much starch there is, etc. What you're seeing here is a recipe for a chemically defined medium. We know exactly how much sodium citrate there is, exactly how much cysteine there is, exactly how much uracil there is, etc. They're all measured out very carefully. An example of a chemically defined media would be minimal media. This is media that contains only the bare essentials for a particular species of microbe to grow. So for instance, most bacteria can manufacture the majority of the amino acids that they need to survive, but there will be a few that they need to get from their environment. Those will be included in minimal media, but the amino acids that they can make themselves, those are not included. We quite often use minimal media to identify genetic mutants. Let's say that we have a bacterium that has a mutation in one of the genes that codes for an enzyme that's needed to make a particular amino acid. This is an amino acid that most members of this species can make. Well, if it can't make that amino acid, that bacterium will not survive on minimal media. We have an example of that here. We've taken two different strains of Bacillus subtilis and plated them onto minimal media. When we talk about strains, we're referring to two distinct populations within a species. These populations differ in their genetics and their characteristics. So we have wild type B subtilis. Wild type refers to the fact that it's normal. It's the most commonly encountered form of the species. It can grow on these plates. The only source of carbon on these plates is lactic acid, but wild type B subtilis has no problem breaking that down and using that to build macromolecules. We also have a mutant form though, and the mutant form can't do this. Presumably that's because it has a mutation in a gene that codes for one of the enzymes that's needed for that biochemical pathway. In general or complex media, we don't know the exact composition. We have thousands of molecules present and we can't say the exact ratios. So for instance, in this recipe here, we have one liter of water and we've added eight grams of sodium chloride to that. We've added 15 grams of agar, so this is going to be a solid media. But then note that we've added 5 grams of peptone and 3 grams of beef extract. Peptone refers to short proteins, proteins that have been cut up into smaller bits. So there's going to be a lot of amino acids. In fact, 
probably every single amino acid is going to be represented, but we can't say for sure how much there is of each amino acid. The beef extract is going to contain a lot of stuff. It's going to contain nucleotides and amino acids and lipids and um, perhaps some glycogen, all sorts of stuff. So in a complex media, we have everything a bacterium or other microbe needs to survive, plus a whole lot more. We have everything they can't survive without, and we have the stuff that they would normally make on their own. But of course, they can take that stuff in and use it as well. They can be lazy. So complex media is non-selective in that it won't select against mutants. Even if you're a mutant, there's lots of stuff here. You'll be fine. And it encourages the growth of a broad range of microbes. Enriched media is a complex media that goes above and beyond. So not only do we have this complex mixture of compounds, everything an average bacterium might need to survive, but we've added other stuff as well that will fit the needs of fastidious bacteria, bacteria that have special requirements. It's non-selective again in that pretty much anything can survive on it, but it contains these additional factors that will also allow these really sensitive, these really special bacteria to survive as well. What we've got here is chocolate agar, and unfortunately it doesn't contain chocolate. It contains blood, blood that has been uh, broken down. It's been denatured and lysed to create this chocolate colored media. Selective media, on the other hand, only supports the growth of very specific microbes. Quite often it will contain compounds that are poisonous to everything except the microbe you're interested in. And you can see how this might be important. If you were presented with a mixed culture again, and you just want to pick out one species and grow that as a pure culture, well, you might use selective media. You might use a media that will kill off everything else except for the bacterium you're interested in. In this example here, you're seeing Pseudomonas isolation agar. And this contains a compound known as ergosan. Ergosan is an antimicrobial. It's something that kills most microbes, but it doesn't kill or limit the growth of Pseudomonas. So Pseudomonas will grow, and we can isolate Pseudomonas using these plates. Bacteria and fungi are fierce competitors in the natural world. So it's really no surprise that they have slightly different specializations when it comes to environmental conditions. So bacteria tend to prefer conditions that are near neutral. Now, of course, that's not the case for all species. They also tend to do better at elevated temperatures, so around 37 degrees Celsius. If we want to grow fungi in the lab, we really can't do it on neutral pH media at higher temperatures. The bacteria grow much faster and they will outcompete the fungi. So to grow fungi, we have to use plates that are slightly acidic and we incubate them at room temperature. So that gives the fungus a head start. It gives it the competitive edge. And the fungal plates that we use in the lab are known as SAB plates. And they are a type of selective media because they select specifically for the enhanced growth of fungi. To recap, we've discussed three categories of media. We talked about complex media. This contains a complex mixture of compounds that will allow several different species to survive and grow. We've talked about synthetic or chemically defined media. This is media that contains the bare essentials for a particular species to survive. And we've talked about selective media, which generally will select against certain microbes. It may contain toxins that will kill off everything except the particular species or group of microbes that we want to study. We have one category left, and that's differential media.
Differential media will allow several different species to survive and grow, but they will look different on the plate. The colonies will look different. So we can use differential media to identify different species on one plate or to identify different genetic strains of the same species that have different characteristics. It's important to note that any particular media doesn't have to belong to just one category. We could, for instance, have complex media that is also selective and also differential. In this example here, we're seeing differential media that will allow us to identify cells that are capable of breaking down lactose. This media contains a compound known as XGAL, and XGAL is very similar in shape and configuration to lactose. If something can break down lactose, it can and will break down XGAL as well. But when XGAL breaks down, it produces a product that's blue in color. So if we take a mixture of bacteria, spread them onto one of these plates, some colonies will be white. Those will contain cells that can't break down lactose and thus can't break down XGAL. But there will also be some blue colonies, and these are made up of bacteria that can break down lactose and thus can break down XGAL. Eosin methylene blue, or EMB media, provides us with another way to test whether or not a particular bacterium is capable of metabolizing lactose. This media contains lactose as a food source and other food sources as well. It also contains two dyes, eosin and methylene blue. Bacteria that are capable of metabolizing the lactose will break it down and generate acidic waste products. The acidity will allow these two dyes to be taken up by those bacteria, and the acidity also allows the dyes to bind to those bacteria, so the colonies will change color. Bacteria that are able to break down lactose will turn purple or even metallic green. Bacteria that can't break down lactose will remain colorless. Now note that the dyes also inhibit the growth of gram-positive and fastidious gram-negative bacteria. So this is also a selective media. Let's take a look at some of the media you'll be using in the lab. So these are definitely examples that you should be familiar with. We'll start with McConkie agar. Now McConkie agar is both selective and differential. It contains crystal violet. Remember that crystal violet binds to peptidoglycan. We use it during gram staining for that reason. Remember also that gram positive cells have a very thick layer of peptidoglycan and it's exposed at the surface. So gram positive cells will absorb a whole lot of the crystal violet and crystal violet is quite deadly to bacteria. It will kill the gram positive cells. Gram negative cells though have a very thin layer of peptidoglycan and they have an outer selective membrane. So the gram violet can't get to the peptidoglycan. So if we were to spread gram positive cells and gram negative cells onto these plates, the gram positive cells would die, but the gram negative cells could survive and grow. So that's the selective part. Now also in this media, we have lactose as a potential food source. In addition to lactose, we have protein. So cells have a choice. They can break down lactose, and that's probably what they're going to do if they're capable of doing so. If they're not capable of doing so, they have protein to fall back on. There's also a neutral red dye, and the neutral red dye will change color if the pH changes. So you can see that in this example here, we've taken E. coli, and we've taken Staphylococcus aureus, and we've streaked them onto a McConkie agar plate. And then we've incubated that, and the Staphylococcus aureus did not grow. And the reason it didn't grow is because it's a gram-positive bacterium. The E. coli did grow, and it also changed color. The reason that the E. coli colonies changed color is because they were capable of breaking down lactose, 
And when they did, that produced acidic waste products. That caused this neutral red dye, which is a pH indicator, to become bright red. If we compare the results for E. coli with the results for salmonella, we can see that there was no color change with the salmonella. And that's because it's incapable of breaking down lactose. It had to live off of the protein. Blood agar plates are made up of triptych soy agar with the addition of 5% whole sheep blood. So they are complex plates and they're also enriched plates. The addition of whole red blood cells allows for the growth of fastidious bacteria. When we grow bacteria on these plates, they result in colonies that have different appearances. So this is a differential plate. Note that it is not a selective plate. Some bacteria will be able to lyse the red blood cells. They split them open and break them down, and that removes the red color from the media. So we see this as a clear area around the colony. That's known as beta lysis. Other bacteria can't lyse the cells completely. They can't break the plasma membrane, but they are able to oxidize the hemoglobin within the red blood cells. And that results in this metallic sheen, but we don't see as much clearing of the area around the colonies. That's something known as alpha lysis. Finally, there are cells that can't do anything to the red blood cells. They'll feed on the other food that's in the media, but they can't break down the red blood cells and they can't oxidize the hemoglobin. They don't have any impact on the red blood cells, so the media around the colonies will not change color. That's known as gamma lysis, which is kind of a weird name because there's no lysis whatsoever occurring. Here, some clever person has taken three different species of bacteria and streaked them out into the three letters of the Greek alphabet that we use to describe the three forms of hemolysis. In the middle, we have beta lysis. Notice that the red blood cells have been completely lysed. They've been broken open, and that results in the disappearance of the red color around this streak. To the left, we have alpha hemolysis. And in this case, the cells have not been broken down, so the media remains red due to the suspended red blood cells, but we do have oxidation of the hemoglobin, and that's changed the color of the colonies and given this a bit of a sheen. And then finally, on the right, we have gamma hemolysis, which is no lysis whatsoever and no oxidation of hemoglobin. As mentioned, plates can be both selective and differential at the same time, and sometimes they can differentiate many different species of bacteria or other microbes. What you're seeing here is a commercially available plate that would often be used in hospitals for testing urine. You can take a little bit of urine and spread it on one side and on the other side of the plate. Notice that there's actually a physical divider between the two halves of the plate. One side will select gram positives, the other side will select gram negatives. But also we have a number of compounds within the media that will differentiate different gram positives from each other and differentiate different gram negatives from each other. And this is based on the metabolism of the bacteria. If they have a certain enzyme present, they'll be able to break down an included precursor that will then change color. If we're growing up microbes in the lab to study them or perhaps to force them to do our bidding by making copies of plasmids, etc., we want to ensure that they're as happy as possible. We want them to have the best possible food to feed on. We want them to have the ideal temperature. Under ideal conditions, bacteria can grow remarkably quickly. E. coli, as I mentioned, can reproduce every 20 minutes. Staphylococcus aureus can reproduce every 30 minutes.
A lot of other bacteria, like mycobacteria, for instance, reproduce much more slowly. In the case of mycobacteria, they have a rather complex cell wall, and it takes a little while to build that and to prepare for division. Division in bacteria is by binary fission. There is no mitosis, there is no meiosis. Remember that we have one great big loop of DNA. The origin of replication is where that loop opens up. And once the origin of replication has been duplicated, it sticks to the inside of the plasma membrane. The cell elongates, and as it does that, it pulls the two new chromosomes apart from each other. Imagine if we were to use an inoculating loop to pick up a colony of bacteria off of a petri plate and dunk them into a fresh tube of liquid media. The bacteria would suddenly find themselves in a vast expanse of food and open space with no competition, and a characteristic growth curve would result. What you're seeing here is that growth curve. We have time plotted along the x-axis and the number of cells as a logarithmic function plotted along the y-axis. It would take a little while for the first set of divisions. So up to this point, those bacteria have all been clustered together in a colony and their growth has been relatively slow because they are competing with their neighbors for food. But suddenly there's no limits on food and resources and all of those cells would be gearing up to divide. So no change in the number of cells yet, but there is lots of metabolic activity going on to prepare for the first division. We refer to this as the lag phase. The next phase is known as the log or exponential phase. And this is where we have lots of divisions occurring as quickly as possible because there's no limits on growth. If we're talking about E. coli, it very well may be dividing every 20 minutes and we get this exponential growth. Now, during this time, the bacteria are focused entirely on growth, and that means they're actually quite sensitive to antibiotics. Also, the bacteria tend to be healthiest during this period. They're not suffering from toxins and so on that have accumulated within the media. That hasn't happened yet. And typically, if you want to maintain a culture within the lab, you always try to keep it in this exponential phase. So after the bacteria get too crowded, you take a little bit out and you add that to a new fresh tube of media. Now, after this log phase, we're going to have what's called the stationary phase. At this point, bacteria are competing with each other and waste products from the bacteria are building up in the tube. So we're assuming we haven't added any fresh media. Nutrients are being used up. And now bacteria are focused on competing and surviving, and they're not focused on binary fission. Finally, if we don't do anything to this tube, we just leave it, the cells will, of course, run out of resources, and we have a death phase that occurs, and the cells will lice. Here's a real-world example. So we've taken five test tubes and started a culture within each of them. And we've started our five cultures at the same time and observed them for five hours. Time is along the x-axis and optical density is along the y-axis. I'll talk more about optical density in a moment, but for now, just realize that it's a measure of the cloudiness of a liquid sample. So as bacteria grow in liquid media, the liquid media, of course, will become cloudier. Note also that the y-axis is a logarithmic scale. Our first value is 0 0.01, then 0 0.1, then 1, etc. If you take uh, something that's changing at an exponential or logarithmic rate and you plot it against a logarithmic scale, you will get a straight line. And that's the straight line that you're seeing here. That's the logarithmic phase of growth. Recall that during this phase, bacteria are focused entirely on division. They aren't manufacturing enzymes that might be needed to fight off antibiotics, for instance. And if you add antibiotics, they have a big impact. For one of the samples, antibiotics were added 
during the logarithmic phase of growth, and you can see this rapid decline in the population of the bacteria. Viruses, of course, don't reproduce through binary fission. They're going to enter into cells or penetrate cells, inject their genetic information, and the cell is going to copy that and use it to make more virus. Because of this, viruses have a very different growth curve compared to bacteria. Imagine that we had some liquid media with bacteria suspended within it, and we introduced some bacteriophage. If we were to monitor the amount of bacteriophage that's suspended within the media, we would find that at first, the concentration of phage would decrease. And that's because these virions are attaching to the host cells and injecting their DNA into them. Next, there's going to be a period of biosynthesis where the cell is copying that DNA and using it to make viral proteins. But eventually there will be a burst time. And the burst time is when the first virions are going to be released from the cells. And remember that we can have one virus entering, but hundreds or even thousands of viruses leaving a host cell. Now for a period of time, many, many cells are going to be lysing. They're going to be breaking open and dumping virions into the liquid media. And we'll get this sharp increase in the population of virions. This is going to level off. And now those new virions are going to go and attach to and penetrate new cells. And we'll get a second cycle. So the population of virions in the media will increase in a stepwise fashion. If we're analyzing a culture within the lab, especially if we want to estimate growth rates, we need to be able to estimate the population size of the culture. How might we go about that? Well, the most obvious thing to do would be to count all the cells. Well, we can't do that for a whole culture tube, but we could take a small sample, put it under the microscope and count the cells that we can see and then extrapolate from that. This is known as a direct microscope count, and it's done using something called a hemocytometer. A hemocytometer is also used to count blood cells, and that's where it gets its name. So this is a special slide, as you can see in the photograph. What you do is you put a cover slip on that slide, and then you add in your sample. The depth under the cover slip is exactly 0.1 millimeters. When you look through the microscope, you'll see a grid that's being etched onto the glass of the slide. And we know the exact area of each of the squares that make up the grid. In the bottom right, you can see the view of a hemocytometer, and we're looking at yeast cells. Each one of those large squares has an area of 0.04 millimeters squared. So a volume of 0 0.004 millimeters cubed. We can count the number of cells in each of those squares, and we would do that for a large number of squares and then take an average. And then because we know the volume, we can extrapolate from there and figure out the concentration of our original culture. Direct microscope counts can be very accurate, but they are quite labor intensive. Also, it can be rather difficult to identify whether a cell is dead or alive when you count it. That may or may not be a problem, but in many cases, you want to know how many viable living cells are present. If that's the case, there's a better way to go about things. You might use a plate count. This is where you take a small sample of your culture, and you may have to dilute it first, as we'll talk about, and you spread that onto a plate that encourages the growth of the microbe you're studying. Then you allow that to incubate overnight in an incubator, look at it the next day and count the number of colonies. Wherever there's a colony, that resulted from one single cell settling out. So if we see 50 colonies on our plate the next morning, we know that we had 50 living viable cells in the sample that we spread on that plate. And once again, we can work backwards to figure out how many cells would be in our original starting culture. Now there's two ways to do this. 
the more usual way to do it is shown on the right. We take some of our sample, we spread it onto the surface of an agar surface. We spread that around using our glass spreader and then we observe the colonies the next morning. The other way you can do it is you can actually take your sample of bacteria, mix it with some agar, and then pour that onto a surface of agar, and then you get colonies that are growing within the media. Here's what that spread plate technique looks like. Now it's important that we get isolated colonies. We want to be able to count colonies. We don't want a lawn of bacteria. So in almost all cases, you would have to dilute your sample first. But you're going to take your diluted sample and you're going to put that onto the surface of the Petri plate. If you want to be lazy, you can use a Lazy Susan to spin the Petri plate while you just hold on to the spreader. You incubate that and then you count the number of colonies that you see the next day. Now, what if we wanted to estimate the population density of a microorganism that's fairly rare in the environment? Well, we're going to need to concentrate it, and we can do that using filtration. So imagine we want to know the population density of E. coli in a local river. It's pretty obvious why we might want to do that. E. coli live in your colon. That's where they're happiest, although they can survive in the external environment for a little while. If there's E. coli in river water, in all likelihood, it means that that water has become contaminated with human waste. Anyway, what we would do is we would take a sample of water from the river. Let's say we want to know how many bacteria are found in one liter of water. We would take a liter of water and we would pass it through a filter that would trap the E. coli. Because the E. coli are quite sparse, they're going to be captured individually. So they're going to settle out individually on the filter. We can then take our filter and press it against a petri plate and the bacteria will be transferred to that petri plate. Once again we're going to allow this to grow overnight and we're going to count the colonies. And then we'll have an estimate of how many viable cells are found in a liter of water from that river. A quick and easy way to estimate the number of cells suspended within a liquid sample is to measure the optical density or turbidity of that sample. Basically, if we have cells that are suspended in liquid, they will scatter and absorb light that hits them. So if we shine light through a sample that has a lot of cells in it, not all of that light will get through we can measure how much light is absorbed by a sample using a machine called a spectrophotometer. The basic principle is really quite simple. Within the machine, we have a light source. We also have filters that allow us to adjust the wavelength of light that's being produced. The light will pass through the specimen and the culture is in a clear tube. Some of the light, as mentioned, will be refracted or absorbed by the suspended bacteria. The amount of light that's transmitted through the sample is dependent on how many bacteria we have. On the other side of the tube, we have a photocell detector that will absorb photons of light that manage to make it through the sample. The machine will then compare how much light was emitted and how much was received, and from that, calculate transmission and absorption. The absorption will be used to estimate the total number of cells. The bacteria cultures that we work with in the lab tend to have very high concentrations, sometimes hundreds of thousands or millions of cells per mill. If we wanted to figure out the number of viable cells by doing a plate count, we couldn't, of course, use that sample directly. If we put that sample directly onto a plate, we would get a lawn of bacteria, and that would tell us nothing. We have to do some serious diluting. And typically that's done by serial dilution. A serial dilution is where you take a sample of your original culture, dilute that, and then take that dilution, and dilute that, and then take that dilution, and dilute that, etc etc you're diluting things in a serial fashion so let's take a look at an example here we have a hundred mils of a culture 
but we don't know the concentration of this culture. We want to figure that out. We could take one mil of that culture using aseptic technique, of course, and transfer it to nine mils of sterile broth and then mix that up. So now what we've done is we've diluted the original sample tenfold. The concentration of dilution one is one tenth of the concentration of the original sample. We're going to do the same thing again. So we're going to take that tube, mix it up really well, and then transfer one mil to a new tube that again has nine mils of sterile broth. So now we have diluted this another tenfold. And then we're going to do that again, and then again. So again, each time we are diluting the concentration by a factor of 10. Now imagine that we take one mil of each of our samples and plate it. In our example here, we find that for our first two dilutions, we get a lawn of bacteria. However, dilution three and four did give us usable results. So we see on plate number three, 53 colonies, and on plate number four, five colonies. Now what that tells us is that that one mil that we took from dilution number three and plated contained 53 live viable cells. So we could work backwards from that and figure out the concentration of our original sample. We could also use tube four to do this, but it's better to have more colonies so long as we can count them. It'll give us a more accurate count. So I'm going to work backwards. So if we had 53 live viable bacteria in that one mil that we took from tube three, that means that we had 530 viable cells in the entire tube. Remember that dilution two is 10 times more concentrated. So there were 5,300 viable cells in that tube. There were 53,000 viable cells in tube one. This all came from one mil that we took from our original sample. So multiplying by 100 now, we get the number of cells in our original culture. Of course, to grow something in culture, we first have to collect a sample from the environment. It might be from an environmental survey. So for instance, like you did in lab when you went around the college and swabbed different surfaces. Or we might be talking about samples that were collected from a patient. If that's the case, we have a number of different tools at our disposal. If we're trying to figure out what's living on the skin, we would simply take a sterile swab and swab the skin. Or we could use the swab to swab body orifices. A needle would be used to collect blood or cerebral spinal fluid. We can use a tube to collect chyme from the stomach and investigate what might be there. To investigate what's living in urine, we can just take a urine sample or we could take a sample through a catheter. For lungs, we look at sputum, which is the material that you cough up if you have a respiratory infection. And for disease tissue, of course, we can do a biopsy and remove that damaged tissue. To summarize, binary fission is a very rapid process and it allows bacteria to reproduce quite quickly, although there are some exceptions like the mycobacteria that we talked about. Microbes and viruses have very different and very characteristic growth curves. Be familiar with these. Microbes have very different nutritional, chemical, and physical requirements, and we need to know these if we want to grow particular species in the lab. We also need to know these if we want to kill them outside of the lab, and that's going to be our focus in the next topic. Microbes naturally grow as complex communities, but generally when we're studying microbes in the lab, we want to grow them as pure cultures. Media may be non-selective, selective or differential, or a combination of these. Be familiar with the examples that we went over. Know when you might use one of these media. So what would the goal be in using a particular medium? The size or concentration of microbe populations can be estimated using direct or indirect means. Be familiar with the different techniques that we talked about and know their strengths and weaknesses. Here are the terms that you should be familiar with. 
And finally, here are some study questions to share with your closest friends.